Hi, everybody. Welcome to the International Water Resources Association webinar on COVID-19 and water. Um, we have a really great panel, a lot of uh, experts who have um, joined us here today uh, from the university and from um, uh, policy uh, focused uh, groups. And uh, we're going to get started in just uh, two or three minutes. Uh, just to give everyone a chance to get ready and get your last glass of water or coffee or uh, whatever the appropriate uh, beverage of your hour is. And uh, we'll get started in just one second. So thank you for joining us here today. Thanks, Dan. All right, everybody. Well, like you said, this is the, uh, for new people joining us, we have uh, up over 100 people now. Um, this is the International Water Resources Association webinar on COVID-19 and uh, water, as you can imagine. And um, we are going to get started here in just one or two minutes. Um, so if you have a chance to quickly take care of any last minute needs, grab a piece of paper, uh, notes, uh, or a glass of water, or whatever you need, uh, we'll be starting in just one or two minutes. So thank you very much. Okay, looks like it's a couple minutes after the hour, and it's a good time to get started. So, everyone, thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, this is the International Water Resources Association webinar on water and COVID-19. Today, our panel includes Dan Deere from Water Futures Australia, Rosina Giron from the uh, Department of Genetics at the University of Barcelona, Joan Rose, uh, Chair of Water Resource at Michigan State University, and uh, Dr. Gurjan uh, Nidima at uh, TU Delft. So as you know, this is a webinar hosted by the International Water Resources Association, and the IWRA is an international network of researchers, practitioners, uh, who work on a multidisciplinary range of water resource issues. We are a nonprofit, non-governmental educational organization. Um, the IWRA provides a global and knowledge-based forum for bridging disciplines and geographies by connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations, institutions, everyone who's concerned with the sustainable use of the world's water resources. So um, we're really happy to have you here today, and we thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have a great panel, a lot of uh, researchers who have come and joined us here. Uh, you know, this, this crisis has come on us all rather quickly, and so we were able to contact these uh, researchers at rather the last minute. and. Uh, Appreciate them all for making time in their schedule, uh, busy schedules to join us here today. Um, our panel will talk about COVID-19 and water and the impacts on our water resources. Um, and you know, there's no research uh, linking uh, drinking water supply to COVID-19, but the way that this has impacted our water resources and our water governance um, is quite clear. Um, I mean, there's many different facets by which we can explore this question, um, including, you know, looking at questions around municipal drinking water systems, which I know many of our researchers have worked on, um, and their abilities to do filtering and disinfecting, um, and to use the water resources to detect the viral load. Um, at the same time, there's another questions around fresh water resources and the ability to do the simple things that we know will stop the virus, such as uh, hand washing. So we really think it's important um, to fully discuss and uh, pull out the questions between um, what is the links between water and the virus. So I just want to briefly explain today's water webinar in case you haven't uh, joined us before. Um, we're going to start out with all of our panelists giving a quick uh, presentation um, with PowerPoint and those PowerPoints will be made available on our website www.iwra.org uh, shortly thereafter the uh, webinar. Give us a couple of days and we'll have uh, the a recording of the webinar up as well as the copies of the presentations. But then we will go to audience questions. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, 
you'll see over on your GoToWebinar control panel about uh, halfway down it says questions. You go and type your question in there, it'll come right to me. At the conclusion of all the uh, presentations, I'll have a chance to moderate the questions and send them to our respective panelists. Now, um, if we don't have an opportunity to get to your questions, we will um, collect them at the end and see if we have an opportunity for our panelists, if they have a chance to write that write out a short response for you um, and post that on our website as well at www.iwra.org. Um, no promise how long the questions will be because I know they're all quite, or the responses will be, they're all quite busy uh, panelists, but uh, we'll do our best to get your questions answered. We appreciate you having taken the time to uh, join us here today. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Dan Deere at Water Futures Australia. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you. And so um, I'm going to pick up the screen and take over the screen and uh, give you sure, a bit of a over. overview. Now, just going back, my background is um, is microbiology. So of course I'm interested in these types of uh, pandemics and outbreaks. But I didn't think this was one that would affect much the water industry because it was a, a respiratory disease like an influenza or something like that. And in the past those types of disease outbreaks haven't had a very major effect in water and sanitation. We tend to deal in gastrointestinal diseases, viral diseases, so things like cholera and typhoid, and more recently things like norovirus has been the problem on cruise ships, not the, the COVID-19 virus. So this was a bit of a surprise, I think, to the water industry in some ways and the water resources sector. But it's turned out that this has had major implications for the, the water resources and the water industry, and it will have for some years to come, I think. So what I'll do is give a very quick presentation that gives an overview of many of the areas of impact, and then the, um, the speakers coming afterwards will give some specific examples of some really interesting research projects and scientific work that they've been doing, investigating in more detail in a few examples. So I'll just give, it, give them all the overview to start off with. So the first thing is that, um, as you know, Water resources are essential in water sanitation and hygiene. And in this COVID-19 outbreak, um, water sanitation and hygiene has become critically important. We're being told to make sure that we get, get rid of all our contaminated waste. And in many parts of the world, we use water washed sanitation storage systems that require water. We're being told to wash our hands, which means we need clean water washing our hands. We're being told to clean, um, to launder and wash the clothes that we use, to clean down areas that have been potentially contaminated, and to wash food that might have been touched. So having clean, safe drinking water and applying it for sanitation and hygiene purposes has become a critical part of the fight against the COVID-19 virus. So not only is water and sanitation and hygiene required under normal circumstances, it's even more important now. And if those systems break down, it adds extra burden on the health system. So the health system is struggling to cope with the COVID-19 cases. And if we then have other cases of disease from maybe less serious diseases, but nonetheless other cases of disease, that distracts the health system, it adds extra weight to the health system. So these, prevent, these basic preventive water sanitation and hygiene systems are even more important than ever. And I've done a little screen grab there from the World Health Organization's interim guidance they put out on water sanitation, hygiene, and waste management. And they're not saying you need to be concerned about catching the virus from drinking water. What they're talking about is the critical importance of providing water sanitation and hygiene during this pandemic. So this is saying that water then is an essential service, sanitation is an essential service. That, I suppose we already knew, the. The other area that was interesting though is when we look at the water resources, it's made us realize that water resources are important for other things too. For example, in many parts of the world, the water supply is connected to buildings and uh, connected to fire extinguishing systems that's used for firefighting. So if we lose the water services, we lose fire fighting ability. It's used for irrigation, aquaculture, for food supply. It's used for recreation. It's used for cooling and dust suppression, for manufacturing and mining, and also, of course, for environmental flows and managing environmental outcomes. So water resources have all those core functions as well. And you might not think, and we didn't think at first, that the COVID-19 outbreak would affect any of those. 
but it turns out those are also under threat from this outbreak. So I'll give you a few examples of some of the things that have been happening and have caused us difficulties. One is we've had some problems with workers not being able to come to work. We've had problems with infrastructure failing. We've had problems with supply chain. We've had major problems with public perception and a, a small number of other impacts. And I'll just give a, a few quick tangible examples of some of those. So for example, we have had some workers becoming ill. Um, certainly in many countries, the workforce in the water resources sector is quite an aged workforce on average. Um, and they, we have quite a number of workers have become ill from COVID-19. And this has had direct impacts in the availability of workers. Then we've had many younger workers that are maybe caring for others. For example, maybe they're caring for their relatives um, uh, or other people that have been made ill or they are supporting in other ways. For example, the health departments that work in with the water sector, those staff have been re-tasked to work on COVID-19 work. They're no longer able to work on the water and sanitation areas that they normally work in. So they have pushed back on a whole range of initiatives and programs to provide water and sanitation because they are stressed and working in this other area. And then we, of course, we have many of the schools are closed, maybe aged care facilities are closed so we have people caring for family members and unable to work so this is causing a major problem with um, workers and people being unable to come to work so the way workers that are working then become more stressed and it's becoming very challenging for them and in the past the incident response systems were designed to last a few days maybe a couple of weeks for a typhoon or a cyclone but were not designed to last for 18 months for a pandemic so People are struggling with this. Then there are also some fears, and uh, we'll hear more about that in a moment from the other speakers. But uh, so I'll just very quickly mention this, but many workers are afraid of uh, becoming contaminated from one another. For example, they often have to work in vehicles or in small spaces like sewer pits or treatment works where they're close together, or they're afraid of getting contaminated from the virus in the sewage. And I won't discuss that because you'll hear more about that in a moment. We're also seeing infrastructure failures because we're having many of our construction sites closed and that's leading to delays in infrastructure um, as well as inability to reach sites, particularly remote sites, and to conduct works. And so far, these have been very minor. If this goes on for 18 months, we could see uh, problems with uh, security of things like water tanks, uh, things like treatment plants where they do for some upgrade or some replacement being delayed because it's not considered safe for the workers to work on that infrastructure. So these are examples of emerging problems. Another area we've seen problems with is supply chain. There already have been a number of reports of uh, difficulty getting certain treatment chemicals that are used in water treatment and wastewater treatment. Even things that might seem cheap and plentiful like carbon dioxide have been running short. Then likewise materials uh, for infrastructure there's been major difficulty in ship and air transport, as well as road transport, meaning certain materials and construction materials are not readily available. Many laboratories have been closed down, or the laboratories have been retasked to COVID-19 response, which means they're not available or the reagents are not available. Some of the work that uh, He Chan will be talking about shortly, for example, in wastewater testing, is being held up because we can't get the reagents to do that testing. And then we have difficulty with specialists. For example, in Australia, we rely a lot on uh, American uh, and German um, specialists for many of the high-end technologies that we use. They have to fly in and go into quarantine for 14 days before they can come and do the work. So there are these kinds of problems in getting specialist people and specialist types and equipment uh, to keep our systems working. So these are some other supply chain, and these are starting to emerge. We're seeing tangible examples. These problems could grow and we will see people fighting over the materials. Then there's public perception. We have seen fear of sewage impacts on drinking water, whether drinking water is impacted by sewage. People are afraid to go to the beach or swim in water and contamination of food from irrigation by recycled water, as well as some surprising fear from drinking water, which we can show by scientific reasoning isn't important because there's good controls for drinking water, but nevertheless, there's been a lot of fear. We've seen excessive sales of bottled water, 
uh, due to this, and we've had to put a lot of information out to the community to allay their concerns. There's some other surprising impacts too. We've seen a lot of sanitizers, detergents, and cleaning materials blocking sewers, causing problems in sewers. There's a major problem because of the economic impacts with people unable to pay for water and sewer services. And because of the economic impacts, a lot of governments are saying they will cut back on water resources protection. They want to cut back on investment in wastewater treatment, environmental management, um, reforestation, other things that are done for environmental reasons. So there's a potential for undermining of broader water resources protection because of the fear of the cost that would have. So, but in terms of solutions, there's a number of things we'll talk about. One is communication with workers and the public. There's been excellent material developed by a range of agencies around the world, the World Health Organization, uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, various other agencies. I put an example here from the US EPA that's very informative. Um, and this information is being is very helpful and it's readily available. So if there are concerns, you can find very reliable information. The water utilities are looking at working arrangements where they try to work remotely, as well as setting up A teams and B teams so that if one person becomes ill and the rest must be isolated, only the A team is affected, the B team can keep working, as well as putting in place backup teams and mutual support arrangements between agencies and are working hard on supply chain management. The other exciting area, which is a positive area, is people are talking about the opportunities that may follow, because after the economic problems we have, we hope that governments will want to invest in infrastructure to stimulate the economies, and water infrastructure is a very good long-term investment, a low-risk, high-return investment. And so there's an opportunity to invest in water protection and water resources management as a follow-up to help employ people and help rebuild the economy in the future. So we're thinking forward as well about opportunities, not just immediate solutions. I'll just finish with some links. These will be in the presentation. I won't read them out, but some good examples from um, World Health Organization and some good industry guides. And there are many more you can find that are available. I've just put a few of the ones I think are the most useful on this presentation. Um, now, we'll, that's an overview. You can see there are many, many examples there of, of concerns and problems and now we'll hear some presentations about some in some detail about some of those from uh, the next speakers thank you so much Dan. that was a really great introduction i think kind of framed out the conversation that we're looking to have today um and sort of set up our like you said for the rest of the speakers who might give us a bit more detail um i really appreciate how you were able to sort of link through the ways that the virus is impacting our water resources and the way that we're consuming water but also the way that it's consuming it, it, it's impacting our human response to maintaining our water infrastructure uh the ability to actually go out there and, and take care of that kind of day-to-day -day thing that a lot of people overlook uh, often forgotten so our next up presentation will come from uh, rosina Giron at uh university of barcelona thank you Hi, thanks. I'm really happy to be in this webinar with so many exciting presentations with my colleagues. Um, I'm going to talk um, briefly on the characteristics of the virus as a water contaminant. And we may review what we know and what we don't know. So you will see that there are many questions open. Uh, but um, we will try to, to find uh the the what do we know that could really make uh, sars coronavirus as a water contaminant so um let's introduce the virus we all know that uh, it's a coronavirus and the classification as the virologists we like to classify every everything so we have here a strain severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 uh, that belongs to the species, species uh, SARS coronavirus and the coronaviridae family. Uh, let me just uh, comment that this is the seventh member of the coronavirus family that infects humans, and we are getting used to get every few years a new coronavirus. So unfortunately, it looks like we will 
get new visitors also, no? Um, the viral particle for the environmental virologists has been a, it's a little bit different than the ones we are used to work with. We are used to work mainly with the enterovirus, I mean with enteric viruses, even including respiratory viruses, but all of them, strong viruses that are excreted and they have this external protein cover coronavirus. They, they have the honor to be a really complex uh, RNA virus family and they have the, the longest genome, 30,000, between all the RNA virus infecting humans. So the, the structure is an RNA virus associated to a nucleoprotein, um, and that's covered by a uh, lipidic envelope with different proteins of the virus, a spike, a membrane, and envelope. <clears throat> so the, you, will hear, you will hear a lot on the um, uh, envelope, lipidic envelope of those viruses, because that's a very important characteristic. We all know that viruses with lipidic envelope are much more fragile in the environment than a virus with a external cover made by a strong proteins. No, uh, I show here also to the the structure of a couple of genomes just to show you that we have um, yes, that we have different regions. Uh, that are selected as the favorite regions for PCR assays. So just the, the end, pro the region codifying by the nucleocapsid protein, envelope protein, and the polymerase protein. There are also for the spike, but those could be maybe the main regions used for the detection protocols. Let's just review very quickly also what could be important to, to, to bring now on the table related to the pathology of uh, the virus, the, the disease COVID-19, a disease that has been nominated by the WHO as a public health emergency of international concern. We all know that the primary transmission is through respiratory secretions and droplets and direct contact. And we will analyze here also the possibility of other transmission routes. The incubation period is from 1 to 14 days, mostly 3 to 7, and median age of patients 47 to 59. Unfortunately, patients above 80 years of age had an alarming high fatality rate of 14, more than 14 percent. Um, the pathology associated to COVID-19, it's really complex and is now being, of course, investigated and more and more information is coming. It has not really been yet well characterized. The most common is very light infections with few symptoms, cough, uh, headache, myalgia. But uh, you know, sometimes it's complicated and it comes with a pneumonia and could be shortness of breath and could be really, could evolve to really critical diseases with uh, septic shock, um, multiple organ failure. And, um, and also with some implications, uh, when the evolution becomes really critical, the virus has seen to also uh, produce um, uh, infect uh, kidney, heart, and in, in central nervous system too. So it's a really complex disease that we are still learning. So what do we need to know to evaluate the role of this virus as environmental or water contaminant? Uh, of course, if we want to stop the transmission of the virus, we need to know about discretion. And um, we, know, we know now that uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is excreted in stools, also in absence of gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, we know that in some studies, like uh, about half a percent of the patients were excreting the virus in the stools, and some of them could really excrete for for a long time, uh, even four or five weeks um, of excretion. So I, uh, is it important to consider the careful hand and toilet disinfection is required? And disease severity was not neither associated to the extended duration of fecal uh, positive samples. Uh, well, the excretion is really important. Also has been described that maybe children may be a, a, a more important excretors. But uh, I, I isolate like virus from feces is not easy. And there are very few studies that they succeed doing that. So. Uh, a couple of patients, they could isolate the uh, virus infectious from a couple of patients that did not have diarrhea, in fact. 
However, many studies could not do that. So that could be an indication that uh, is not really the infectivity level of those PCR positive samples may be low. It's an indication. But of course, as you can imagine, we need more information. I like to show pictures. It's like we talk to somebody, it's nice to get a picture. So those are my electronic mic micrographies showing uh, images of different uh, enveloped viruses excreted in feces. In feces, we could detect respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, uh, and as a DNA virus also, we find uh, sequences of herpes, and also coronavirus, of course. You could see here that this external envelope made by uh, a lipidic, um, a lipidic uh, cover uh, makes the virus um, pleomorphic. And that also gives an indication they are much more fragile. So that's a fact, no? Even though it seems that coronavirus could be between the most robust of all the enveloped viruses, probably, as far as we know by now. So, of course, I mean, even if it's uh, maybe the infectivity could be low in feces, we now know that virus have been isolated, infectious virus from feces. So, um, virus could be excreted in feces and could be infectious. So will this virus be stable in the water? Uh, what do we know by now? Uh, not much, but because this virus is 80% similar to SARS coronavirus and uh, maybe some things in common with other coronavirus, we can also recall available information from other coronavirus. So we know in some studies made by um, Gundi et al. that uh, human coronavirus as the 229E it was found to be very stable at four degrees in tap water, comparable to poliovirus one. So in filter, tap water, four degrees, the virus could be stable for a long time, this coronavirus. Um, comparable, comparable or even more than poliovirus one. However, um, when we went in sewage and in higher temperatures, then poliovirus was much more stable. This is just a study, of course, we need to recall and, uh, and have much more data to get a strong conclusion. So one of the conclusions is that we don't have much data and we, of course, will need more information. Also, there are some studies, preliminary um, studies on aerosols, stability of SARS coronavirus 2. And it was um, an experiment well controlled. It was like three hours uh, stable in uh, aerosols, but we don't, it's really hard to extrapolate what happened in field conditions, no? Once you, we don't have such an environment. And also, let me comment, uh, which is remarkable, it's the preliminary data we have on the stability in a wide range of pH. Uh, 60 minus pH between 3 and 10, the virus was stable. So that means that the possibility of an oral infection is higher than if it was uh, more sensitive to pH. Yeah, so, um, okay, uh, is excreted could be stable for a while. What about in the sewage? Uh, in the sewage, uh, we can now say that the data is accumulating, and Gerja and Medema published the, the, the first study, I think, um, that SARS is, has been detected in urban sewage and has been even quantified in some studies, but too little data to really come up with a number. We, we need to also accumulate more information to know um, and average concentrations of the virus in the sewage. So once in this in the sewage, will the virus be stable there? We don't have the information yet for uh, SARS coronavirus 2, but if we check uh, previous studies made with SARS coronavirus, the previous one, now we call one, uh, we could see that the virus was also detected from hospitals and um, However, in the sewage, uh, hospital, I mean, sewage from hospitals, but was not really, could not be isolated from the sewage as infectious virus. However, experiments seeding the virus in the sewage show uh, a significant stability, 14 days at four degrees and two days at 20 degrees. 
uh, what else do we know? We know also that all these envelope virus tend to uh, have the tendency to adhere, adhere to the solids more than the enteri virus that we are also more familiar with. So, uh, I always like to show a slide with the numbers of other enteric viruses, and I use the slide of one of our last projects. Here you could see many different viruses, and this is in a wastewater. I mean, those are studies done in the entry of a wastewater treatment plant with the samples collected at the entrance, secondary effluent. This is a conventional, uh, secondary, uh, conventional activated sludge uh, plant and also a uh, wetland that could be like the tertiary treatment. So we could see how adenovirus is reduced over the treatment, and we could see the numbers that we had at the beginning, 10 to 4 per 100 ml, sometimes 10 to 5, uh, quite constant all over the year, 100% positive sample, JC a little bit more variable, um, that's Merkel cell. Uh, let's focus now better on norovirus. You, you are, most of you are more familiar with noroviruses and you know that noroviruses can change a lot over the year. And the numbers at the cold months could be really high, 10 to 6 per 100 ml. So those are really high numbers of viruses. Our wastewater treatment plants deal in our regulations, deal with those um, viruses that we already know there and they are much more robust. We know that they are much more robust in the environment and in the wastewater treatment plants compared to the coronavirus. So let me just uh, finish saying that we have been doing many meta water, uh, sorry, metagenomics studies and using also target enrichment for vertebrate viruses and envelope viruses are not normally found uh, in most of the studies. So we will, that will be really uh, something uh, unusual. So we will, we, we know from many data accumulated that the stability of the viruses in the environment of the envelope virus is really low. So let's just move quickly to a few conclusions. Uh, fecal excretion exists and that could be a source of environmental contamination, fomites, and also that can contribute to viral transmission. But let me tell you, that we need more numbers. We, we cannot yet quantify how much virus are excreted. Uh, and we need, of course, do, do to all these study, quantitative studies to really find how many viruses are really coming to sewage with the possibility to come to sewage. Um, I think it's interesting to keep in mind that if SARS coronavirus 2 behaves as SARS coronavirus 1, which we could expect so in many, in many ways because already studies comparing both has been showing that they are quite similar. If they are really similar also in the stability in sewage, we could maybe expect 14 days uh, sewage at four degrees and around two days uh, 20 degrees of stability if uh, infectious virus are in the sewage. So uh, we also must keep in mind that aerosol contamination from fecal wastes must be controlled, especially at low temperatures. But altogether, the information that we have now indicates that infectious SARS coronavirus 2 will be less abundant in sewage than other known enteric viruses. And also, they should be less resistant to water treatments in wastewater treatment plants or drinking water treatment plants for sure. Also, let me just finish in the available international guidelines for water treatment and reuse. Uh, should be also efficient uh, for SARS coronavirus too. So I finish here. This is the team that work uh, in all the when we do all these environmental studies, and I just thank them and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. I appreciate that you ended on a positive note. I, I feel like that gives us a little bit of hope uh, that uh, we can uh, really well address this kind of uh, crisis um, going forward. So, and I appreciate also the way you're able to frame this. Um, a lot of times I think this is sort of a presented as it's, it's a, a completely un, unknown, uh, you know, it, it's impacting us in unknown ways. But in fact, you know, using the research that you've um, been able to show us, I think it, it is, it, it, it follows certain uh, known ways uh, that the other viruses in the past have worked. Of course, different, but uh, it follows some of those. So I think it was able to kind of frame that in. And to the uh, people uh, watching us in the audience, just to remind everybody that we'll be doing audience questions after the conclusion of these four uh, presenters. 
But if you go ahead and like to send in a question now, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, you'll see about halfway down on your um, uh, control panel there. It's on the right side of my screen. It just says questions. If you type in the questions, uh, it'll come right to me. And then at the end of the, uh, the presentations, I'll send them off to our, uh, moderate them out to our panelists. Uh, but for now, let's go on to our next presenter, uh, Joan Rose at Michigan State University. There we go. There Hello, go. everyone. Thank you. All right, here we go. That's so great. I'm going to talk about um, train mapping. Thank you, Scott, and uh, for asking me to to be here and um, welcome to the global audience. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about monitoring mapping the impacts of, of sewage. And um, I wanna remind everyone that there, and I think Rosina did a very good job of, of setting this up towards the end of her presentation. There are hundreds of different pathogens which are excreted. They're found in excreta and sewage. We divide them into four main groups um, when we work in this arena. Uh, the viruses, which is where coronavirus belongs, um, but also that includes rotavirus, hepatitis A virus, and norovirus. Of course, the bacterial group, which is cholera and typhoid, are, are ionic um, bacterial species that cause waterborne disease. Um, and then uh, and they also include our indicator system in which we evaluate our water quality. The protozoa, the little animals, Cryptosporidium giardia and entamoeba, um, that grow in the intestinal tract and, and produce egg-like structures, cysts and oocysts, they're quite resistant. And then of course the worms, uh, the helmets and, and uh, um, hookworms and uh, that type of, of group, uh, which generally end up in the sludge, they're quite large. These pathogens cause a, a whole a variety of diseases, um, some that are very cute, diarrhea and respiratory illness. And yes, we do find respiratory uh, viruses in sewage, including adenoviruses and Coxsackie viruses. But we're also concerned with chronic illnesses, heart inflammation. Some of these viruses are associated with cancer, neurological disorders, liver damage, kidney failure. Um, and so we've got a whole range of illnesses we're concerned with. And we know pathogens matter globally. We still have um, waterborne cholera throughout the world, um, where we're trying to uh, diminish that through a good sanitation, drinking water. Uh, typhoid is still found in many parts of the world. Um, this upper upper graph here is the rotavirus, uh, and that's glo very global, um, associated with diarrhea in young children. Cryptosporidium, also a zoonotic pathogen, which comes from animal waste and human waste, uh, very global. And then we've got some of our worms here in the left corner, is schistosoma, which um, have geographic restrictions depending on their lifestyle. So these pathogens matter, they're global issues, but generally we worry about these outbreaks, uh, you know, very uh, locally. Now, pathogen type is very important to the science of sewage and health. Uh, first of all, size. Size is important because it's, um, it, it uh, influences removal by treatment and our ability to kill the organisms through disinfection. It's also important to, for the transport into groundwater. Uh, Rosina talked a lot about persistence and survival. That's a key element of interest. And uh, these different groups of pathogens have different uh, persistence in the environment. Um, the eggs and oocysts and cysts can be very, very resistant, whereas others are highly influenced by environmental factors. Um, and of course, I've mentioned that it influences removal by treatment systems. The type of treatment system we might use in a wastewater plant, everything from lagoons to activated sludge um, to reclaimed water systems, which use filtration. 
And of course, these pathogens vary in their potency. That is uh, how infectious they are at, at, at low doses, right? We talk about dose response for these pathogens, and we do have a yardstick now of how uh, potent they are at causing infection. And this, this potency is related to how rapidly organisms can spread around. Um, but then we have the disease risks. What are the outcomes? And of course, you know, they can have very high outcomes. It's interesting that this particular virus we're talking about today, coronavirus, as, as Rosina said, um, is very mild in a high percentage of the population, but has this really high mortality in our sensitive population. So we care about that. And for the most part, we care about pathogen type because our indicators that we normally use for water are inadequate, which means that we have to look for the pathogen specific or we have to look for a new indicator. So because our indicators are bacteria, they're not very good for virus as virus indicators. Now, I just want to remember every, remind everyone that what Rosina was saying in general, the viruses are obligate parasites. They only replicate within the cell. Once they're released by the host, they're these inert little particles. They're nano. That means we can only see them under the electron microscope. This, um, these structures, uh, this uh, simple nucleic acid inside covered by what we call this coat, protein coat, um, makes the structures very, very stable and also resistant to our treatment. And some of these viruses have this envelope as coronavirus does, which is a lipid component. And that also influences its persistence and removal by treatment. Now, I wanna talk about the Global Water Pathogens Project a bit here. Um, because we started this about uh, five years ago, 2014. It's a global project. Um, it's an online platform. It's produced a book um, with um, <laughs> hundreds of chapters and data tables. The goal was really um, to redo a book that was done by the World Bank um, by Feacham on sanitation. And um, its mission is this to be a, a knowledge resource, a hub about water pathogens, which will guide the goals for sanitation, for achieving safe water around the world. And using the power of, of new information and, and of course technology tools. And I've, I've listed the website there, waterpathogens.org. You can Google it and get to the book. Um, we have nine chapters on viruses. Here's the original feature book. Sanitation and Disease, we, we renamed this now Sanitation to Disease for the 21st Century. Um, so there's nine chapters on viruses. Rosina was one of the key editors on this uh, uh, set of um, chapters. We've got 10 chapters on bacteria, eight on protozoa, and 13 chapters on helmets. And the goal was to summarize quantitative data on occurrence and sewage. What we know about the disease prevalence, its global distribution, occurrence and sewage, persistence, removal by treatment processes, and then um, uh, ultimately to try to understand risk, to have this data understand risk. Now, this has started to support a new platform called the Knowledge to Practice platform. And these are sanitation decision support tools which are using the data not only from this, this website, but um, global data sets or even local data sets. One is focused on the pathogen flow tool, which maps how pathogens move through the treatment system. Can we look at how we enhance removal? What are the operational parameters? But the other one is the mapping tool. And I want to end by uh, my short presentation by talking about this mapping tool. Now, um, Nika Hofstra is leading this group. Um, and uh, her group at the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands has um, is globally renowned for mapping contaminants in water everything from nutrients to you know uh, to other types of particles and nika took on the mapping of pathogens so why would we want to map them well we already know that monitoring for individual pathogens is very difficult in the water environment in spatial and temporal conditions and so we miss we can miss things so can we use our current data to understand what's going on at a, at a global scale or at a broader scale. Uh, this has been used for hotspot identification, certainly used to look at transboundary water contamination issues and the links between land use and the sources of these contaminants, climate and water quality, and ultimately health. 
and moving from uh, you know what we know about pathogens to their excretion levels to what happens in wastewater plants to what what's happening in the water environment. And these can be used for scenarios who are making decisions about uh, uh, future investments. Now, um, uh, the, the mapping that's been done has focused on a number of organisms. This is rotavirus. Um, and it's based on, on population, on what we know about global populations, children and adults, excretion rates, and wastewater treatment plants and how much the virus might be removed. Um, and we can, um, this is a about a hundred kilometer squared resolution. And uh, Nika and her team are now looking at reducing this to a higher resolution. And she's working in with the K2P team in Uganda right now. We have some case studies up on how to bring this down to a higher resolution for making decisions about septic tanks and um, enhancing wastewater treatment before discharge and this type of thing. Um, but these are the types of maps where we can go in and out and try to look at uh, what are the next steps for monitoring, what are the next steps for reducing infection, what are the next steps for um, uh, enhancing wastewater treatment. Now, we know um, the current of SARS uh, is in sewage, and um, this may be a way to monitor the infection in the community. Uh, there's several questions that have emerged, and this is the global map from John Hopkins University, uh, which has been highlighting the cases of individuals, the cases of, that have been reported of, of coronavirus in the populations uh, around the world. Um, and so here's another map. This is, a, this is a global virus. We know now it's found in fecal material, and we know it's found in sewage. And, Gutzen's going to follow up with my presentation with more discussion of this. But why would we want to even do this? Well, we think we can link, dis link disease cases and infections um, to, uh, to look at the community uh, uh, risk or the community health by evaluating concentrations in sewage. We know that asymptomatic individuals, people that get the virus but don't have any symptoms at all, may be excreting. Those with mild symptoms that don't even know they're infected um, are excreting, and of course, those that are symptomatic that are that are quite ill, maybe in hospitals, and are excreting. Um, we really want to be able to monitor the increasing sp spread of this uh, virus in communities um, uh, and the speed of the spread. People are talking about the second waves once we start. Um, you know, taking care of this initial uh, spread of the disease. Um, people are already talking about second waves in Singapore and in Korea. And so what's that going to look like? Can we get a handle on that? What are the impacts of social distancing? How did that impact um, our ability to decrease uh, the disease? And uh, we're going to be reopening our cities, reopening our economies. And we don't yet, re reopening our universities, as a matter of fact, um, that's a big question we have and maybe monitoring our own university here at, in Michigan. And so what does that mean? Can we get a sense of what's going on by monitoring the sewage? So again, we think maybe this can identify hotspots in the sewer shed and provide early warning. We don't know yet. This is just emerging. But this is certainly a, a great area of interest, of course, besides understanding the, uh, the occurrence in, of the virus in sewage its risk to wastewater workers and its removal by treatment processes. So we know there's wastewater surveillance going on for the coronavirus. Um, Gretchen Manaba put a, a brief, and I know that there's a lot more dots on this map now. Um, here's the preliminary locations where we think sewage monitoring is um, ongoing or may be occurring in the future. Um, and I know of, of several other dots now in South America. So I think we can learn about community health. And I think we can learn more about global disease by the comparative spatial and temporal analysis in these different locations. And, and we're hoping that uh, we can gather um, this information so that it can be useful um, for uh, future modeling, for looking at different communities and different strategies and, and maybe answer the previous questions I, I mentioned. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to turn, um, stop here and turn this over um, to, um, back to Scott and then uh, to Gretchen. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much for that great presentation. Really appreciate that. And it was interesting hearing about the potential that this mapping and, uh, has. And uh, again, you know, just as we were speaking with the present, uh, previous presentation, it's important to kind of look at the ways that we've been able to refine our model based on previous viruses to now be able to apply to this virus and hopefully, of course, uh, to future viruses, uh, to future uh, pandemics. Um, yeah, ab or, absolutely. Or, or outbreaks of any type of virus, uh, regional, or not uh, global. So I think that that's really helpful. Can I also just also remind us that uh, this is, uh, while uh, unprecedented times, it's also something that we have researchers who are doing work on this. So we, we can address this. It can be done. So our final presentation today will come from uh, Gerte Amadima. Uh, and I'm turning the floor over to you. Thank you. My screen is visible now, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, looks great. Okay, perfect. That's a call. Well, thank you um, for the invitation. Thank you uh, all for uh, tuning in on the on this. Yes, um, I'm going to go further where the others already uh, gave a lot of information about the virus in in sewage and and the the virus itself and what we should think about this in the in the water uh, sector. I will talk about um, um, the coronavirus in sewage and the value of sewage surveillance particularly, um, and also touch again on the health risks of uh, for sewage workers and maybe downstream uh, water um, like be beaches and drinking water. So um, sewage surveillance is something that has been going on already for decades uh, for viruses, and for that matter also for other types of um, of contaminants. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of studies on uh, illicit drugs and pharmaceuticals, uh, but if we in, in sewage to because also there sewage is a mirror of society and also for the virus uh, prevalence in the community. I think that the sewage is also useful as a as a mirror and I'm not the only one to think that um, and this is not the first virus that we think that about. So uh, it started with polio virus surveillance in the polio eradication program under the World Health Organization. And their sewage surveillance was used to look at uh, whether polio virus was circulating in our communities, particularly in our unvaccinated uh, communities. Um, and absence of the virus in sewage was used as uh, uh, to, to inform about absence of the virus circulation so that um, we got rid of the polio virus also in the Netherlands and several other countries like Israel and India and Finland that have all been engaged in um, sewage, national sewage surveillance programs uh, for, uh, for polio virus. Um, in these surveillance programs, it was also demonstrated that it um, can be uh, an early warning tool for uh, also for polio virus, poliomyelitis outbreaks. That was in the 1993 uh, outbreak in the Netherlands. Uh, also there, the signal was first seen in the um, in the sewage, um, and later on uh, turned out to uh, appear in uh, reported cases. So. In the meantime, there have been many studies by many authors uh, in many countries uh, for uh, for many viruses on um, prevalence in sewage, and not only so prevalent concentrations in sewage, but also associations with the the world above, uh, so to say, and so and the circulation of viruses in the population, and again as an early warning for outbreaks uh, of hepatitis A virus of norovirus, uh, like those showed in. Uh, in Norway, and um, but many other viruses also, and our National Institute of Public Health has done quite some uh, sewage surveys uh, for other types of viruses. So again, use cases for that is uh, early warning of outbreaks, looking at virus circulation in the population, and also looking at the, the virus genotypes that are circulating in the population. So. In comes the new virus, a coronavirus, um, and you've heard it already. Um, it's shed uh, by estimates are now uh, around half of the uh, infected uh, people, although I don't think we know it very well yet, particularly not for the, 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 the more mildly symptomatic and maybe even asymptomatic uh, people. 
Um, also concentrations and duration um, are all still, well, we have limited information, but the information we have do, does show that in a significant proportion of people, there is fecal shedding of the virus. So the virus enters our sewers and um, it was already highlighted by, uh, by Rosina um, that uh, at that stage, uh, already in stool samples, it's very difficult to see if there is any infectious virus, even if the RNA copies um, in stool samples are high, uh, it's difficult to culture the virus uh, in cell culture. So it would appear, although it's also always difficult to culture uh, viruses, including this new virus, but uh, um, it would appear that in stool samples, it's not very, uh, that there are not very high concentrations of infectious virus. Um, so stool is not a, an environment um, <clears throat> that where the virus uh, thrives, uh, so to say. Um, but the fact that it is uh, shed in uh, with the stools and detectable or rose the question for us, is it detectable in sewage? And would sewage surveillance be something um, where we could look at society in by looking uh, at um, the stool samples and, or the collective uh, stool samples of the, of the population. So could we analyze virus circulation in a, pop in a city of a million people with just one sample? So yeah, that's what I said. The, the, um, can we use it for, to, to study? Can we use it as an early warning tool? And then the question is, of course, uh, if we sample at the inlet of uh, a wastewater treatment plant of a million city or a people, um, will we, we be able to detect um, this virus with sufficient sensitivity to be meaningful for uh, to, to use as a surveillance tool? Um, the methods, virus concentration, purification um, by um, centrifugation and ultrafiltration uh, methods, relatively um, standard methods that have been developed for waterborne viruses already for a long time and that we had in our lab. Um, uh, we extract the virus RNA from the concentrates and then uh, we have um, qPCR uh, against, uh, we use uh, four targets. Most uh, authors are using um, comparable targets, not, not always the same target, but comparable targets against the N gene. And these targets are all derived from what we know from uh, clinical testing. So we have not developed something special for sewage. We just copy paste uh, clinical testing and apply it uh, to um, sewer testing. So the types of signal uh, we get are the same targets as uh, what they get in clinical testing. And of course, you have to have all the appropriate controls, which is not so easy. Uh, particularly um, for enveloped and for coronaviruses, because we were equipped to look at uh, non-enveloped viruses like the norovirus and the enterovirus uh, and adenovirus, uh, but not so much as um, at enveloped viruses. So uh, we are still working on, on improving our control set. So what did we see? We, uh, we saw the uh, we, we sampled as the virus entered our country, uh, so to say. So um, we started sampling before the virus was reported. So when we saw it was in Italy, but not yet in the Netherlands, uh, we started sample our uh, wastewater. We didn't find the virus then. Of course, we were not surprised to not find it, but we were happy that the methods did not produce any positive signals in, in wastewater when the virus is not there. Um, it was tested in clinical settings, but not in this wastewater setting, but seemed to work uh, and no uh, false positive um, signals. And then as the, um, the epidemic, uh, the, the, the virus came into our country, um, you see on the figure, you see uh, the, the increase of the number of reported cases per 100,000 um, over, over time. And uh, in two cities, and then we, if we look at the, um, the concentration of the, the viral RNA for the different targets that we used, and if you look at then at what happened in the in our cities, you see a sort of concurrent increase in the RNA signal, uh, and you see the different colors that are the different uh, gene targets. I told you we use four targets, but we have quantification only for three yet uh, because we 
did not have the materials for the fourth uh, to be quantitative. So it appears that um, yes, an increase in um, in virus circulation in the population is what you see in uh, the sewer samples. And if you then do it the other way around, you could argue that an increase of the virus in sewage um, would also mean uh, increased circulation in, in the population. If you do everything well and you uh, control for all kinds of elements like uh, wet weather flows versus dry weather flows, but those are things we are uh, we, we know so we can control for. But that, that's um, what the uh, the tests um, indicate, and of course we are now continuing as the epidemic uh, moves along and is now um, over its top and uh, going down again to see if the signal also um, goes down again. Our National Institute of Public Health is doing a national surveillance program um, on 29 cities in the Netherlands where they also couple, um, like here, uh, the underground surveillance, uh, as I call it, and, uh, and the above ground surveillance in the population uh, to see the value and to see if sewage signals can contribute uh, in, um, in decision making. And this was the figure already shown by, uh, by Joan. Uh, we have been that so many people uh, are um, embarking on uh, sewage surveillance uh, or um, at least thinking about embarking on sewage surveillance. We have been approached by, by very many people that uh, want to learn about it. We know that our, um, quite some groups are already uh, taking samples and some are still in lockdown, so they store samples. Others are open and uh, they are processing samples and also finding virus uh, like um, was the, the publication from uh, from Brisbane um, about virus in concentration in, in sewage. Um, uh, from Boston, uh, from um, Austria, from France, I've seen uh, preprints. Uh, of course, it, it still all needs to be um, the preprints, like our own preprint, uh, are under peer review. So uh, we'll have to uh, also be a bit um, uh, patient in terms of really interpreting uh, the, the data after peer review. But at least it does indicate that many people are. Um, thinking about it or uh, acting upon it. Um, and if we then think a little bit about how to use these data, and um, I've seen a, a lot of, or a lot of, several authors are um, trying to translate virus concentration in sewage to um, how many cases there are in the community. Um, my take on it is as a, a bit different. And I think um, you'll see that also as a, the first priority in the Water Research Foundation's um, webinar uh, this evening, uh, Dutch time, that I think the, the, the value is mostly in trends, trend analysis, so relative changes over time. Um, we've seen it, uh, that it works as the epidemic entered our country. So uh, in, let's say, a virgin population where, um, where the virus is not there, uh, you see it coming and you get um, a sensitive early warning signal. In two cities, we had it six days, we found it in wastewater six days before the first reported cases. But um, then, of course, the, the next thing will be, um, the next trend we will be looking at is now as we are moving out of lockdown, and we see the virus circulation decrease, so the, the number of cases de decreasing, the number of hospitalization decreasing. So the, the, do we see the same trend in sewage? And will we then be able to use the, the trend analysis to look at what happens with virus circulation as we slowly or less slowly move out of lockdown? So um, countries that are moving out of lockdown are now really closely monitoring the reproduction rate of the virus, so how many people are infected by a single person. The, the aim is to keep that below one because then the epidemic dies down. Um, Germany, for instance, just reported it was 0.7 uh, during lockdown and now they're moving out of lockdown by opening schools and, uh, and uh, it's creeping up to uh, around one, so they are issuing warnings again. And they use 
again, the health surveillance, uh, clinical testing for that. And I think also here, sewage surveillance could uh, offer uh, extra information um, relatively efficiently um, for looking at what happens in, the, in virus circulation under these circumstances. Of course, we will need to understand uh, our trends well. We need to uh, characterize our trends well. We need to determine when we want to warn um, the, the health authorities about the, the things that we see in the sewers. Uh, and we need to correlate what we see in sewage uh, better in targeted studies with um, uh, the above ground and the underground um, surveillance pr programs tightly knit together. Uh, but I think, well, the, my take on this is that there is promise for uh, for that. Then uh, three slides about um, um, risks, because as you heard from the previous uh, speakers, this is not a typical waterborne virus like the ones that we know that are pretty robust, uh, can survive our treatments uh, pretty well and pose risks when we irrigate uh, our food crops or when we uh, start bathing or produce drinking water. Um, these are the viruses that we know. This one um, is not as robust and is not a, a, certainly not the envelope viruses are certainly not typical waterborne uh, viruses. The, um, the thing to say oh, oops, about uh, health risks to workers, those are the ones that work on sewage are of course most exposed to, uh, to wastewater. Um, there are no epi signals and not in this one, not in the previous SARS virus that there is um, in wastewater systems uh, that there is uh, transmission. Of course, in SARS-1, there was the, the Amoy Gardens case, but uh, we, uh, and that was also WHO's advice, that, that is a very special um, building plumbing situation, but not um, something that happens further downstream in the, in the wastewater. So there are also no case reports. Um, what is detected in, in the sewage is not infectious virus, it's RNA. And what was already discussed um, in stools, uh, they don't seem to already seem to be very infectious. And of course, we would like to uh, have more information on that and also confirm that in sewage, it's not infectious. It's not very robust. You've seen and heard of all about it. Um, there is um, limited uh, evidence yet about uh, effluence. Um, we also look in effluence. Generally, it's negative. We found a few uh, positives in uh, a few of the effluents, but at lower concentrations um, than in the influent, like others have reported. So um, if it's there, it's in low concentrations. And the advice, um, the general advice about uh, personal protection, the PPE uh, for the different activities uh, of sewage workers that are recommended by the occupational health and safety guidelines are adequate also to protect people against this new virus if they need protection at all uh, for this virus um, if we talk a bit more downstream so beaches uh, irrigation water i think well you see the same uh, pieces on the slide i think uh, we can already deduce from what happens upstream uh, that uh, the, the risk will be uh, minor compared to uh, other viruses that we know. Uh, but in, in waters, we also, so in, if they're going into environmental waters, we also understand that they are um, relatively um, fragile and uh, will not survive uh, particularly well in long water. And if we look at beaches and, uh, and other water systems, we know that they are checked usually with uh, water safety plans or sanitation safety plans or beach safety plans and that they are um, that this is confirmed by using fecal indicator bacteria we know they are not the best um, to predict uh, virus risks but uh, we do know that we are controlling the waterborne viruses by uh, this means and if we are controlling these waterborne viruses like norovirus we surely will also control this SARS coronavirus too. So that hence the, the, the last part 
safely managed beaches um, means that the risk of fecal contamination is managed, including the viruses, uh, and that certainly the risk of SARS coronavirus 2 is managed. Uh, and then drinking water, and uh, Dan already started um, uh, with that. Um, yes, we can give long presentations about all the information that is collected about uh, viruses in source waters, uh, about virus removal by disinfection processes, by soil passage, by, by uh, water treatment processes, filtration, uh, coagulation. There's a, a wealth of information uh, there, and that is where um, drinking water safety guidelines are uh, based upon. And um, we know that these protect us against um, the waterborne viruses. So again, if we can say it's drinking water is safely managed um, against these waterborne viruses, it's surely safely managed against uh, SARS coronavirus 2. And with that, um, and acknowledging all the, the people at our institute, uh, KWR, for uh, the contributing to the research and acknowledging uh, the Dutch water authorities that were of great help uh, during our sampling campaigns. Uh, and um, I thank you for your attention. There we are. Scott, we are not hearing you. I would say, please don't go away. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We will have uh, uh, the, the, the Q&A session uh, uh, coming up shortly, but there are some uh, technical uh, issues, but uh, I'm sure we'll resolve that uh, soon. Yeah, we might have so to uh, do the Q&A session without Scott, unless Scott can use sign language and we can all read sign language. <laughs> Well, I was going to ask um, Gerton. I was going to ask you about the the different um, methods. Um, I mean, it's a new virus. Well, both Rosina and um, and Yurchin, <clears throat> you know, looking for envelope viruses is kind of new in water. I mean, we've done a little bit of that on influenza, maybe, but it, it's fairly new. And so, what are we learning now about? the recoveries and, um, you know, it looks like we're gonna need a lot more testing, like you tested four different targets. That's very unusual for most of our enteric viruses. I guess, Rosina, we use one target um, that we feel is good in, in terms of specificity and sensitivity. Are we coming to that point now, uh, knowing what we know about the genome, Rosina, and, and what you know now about applying these Primer sets into wastewater. If I can start the the answer, I think um, yeah, we started with four targets um, just because we were not sure about the specificity of the signal in wastewater. So um, we we really want to be sure that uh, if we if the virus is there, you expect all the four targets to light up, and and that was the was the case. So that helped us with um getting confidence in in our methods and our and the, and the signals uh, we get i feel that um i think we, we can and should move eventually to a single uh, target and um i'm not sure yet i mean we get relatively good uh, signals uh, and also um um calibration or standard curves and and uh, 
the Lucian series with uh, each of the targets. Um, but uh, I think what we what what I said what we need to improve more, at least in our lab, and, I th and also in the, the publications I've seen so far, is that we have good enveloped virus controls um, because now we are using our uh, non-enveloped virus uh, controls, particularly for the concentration step. And we know that coronaviruses are um, maybe more fragile, more sticky. So it may be that our, uh, and there are, uh, uh, Krista Wigginton uh, compared uh, some recovery efficiencies, right. um, corona and with uh, MS2, for instance. And indeed, MS2, uh, you could recover better than you could recover coronaviruses. So I think, yeah, we, we need to uh, characterize uh, the quantity better. Um, and by using these uh, enveloped virus controls. Um, let me comment another thing that I think it's really nice related to testing uh, viruses in sewage. Um, because there's a sort of um, genetic diversity of strains there, and people keep analyzing the, the genetic diversity in, in patients, normally in hospitalized patients. It's nice because I think that uh, testing and checking if we have e concentration enough in sewage to analyze the genetics, we can come up also with um, strains that may be not as virulent. I mean, if there is a, an evolution of the right. virus and if there is a selection for the attenuated or not as virulent strains, the way to find it, it could be the sewage too. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great that we can quantify and detect, but also I think could be a very nice source for a genetic analysis or a molecular epidemiology or what is circulating. Yeah, and that would be very, very important, I think. Yeah. You know, Dan, I, I, I meant to tell you, in our newspaper, our newspaper was uh, an article about um, wastewater workers being concerned with getting the disease. And um, it, it was quoting, luckily I wasn't quoted in there, but it was quoting, you know, utility people and people on the front lines. And I'm wondering if you think what we should do about communication of this to the general public and to the just the general worker. Um, they hear about all this, you know, they know it's in sewage. They're, they know it's being found in feces. So, I mean, what, how do we do a better job of trying to, communicate that our strategies are, are good for protection right now from all these other viruses. If we believe that this is, you know, saying low risk or we don't need to test, doesn't really help the public. Cool. So we have a, one of the Water Research Foundation uh, tasks actually is a communications task looking at how to communicate information about COVID-19 to water workers and wastewater workers. And um, actually it turns out that we have a very positive message to say there because we've had over 100 years managing um, sanitation and, and sewage systems and, and managing them safely for um, viruses that are much more easy to transmit when you handle wastewater than the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we, one of the troubles we're having with measuring COVID-19 virus is that it's quite vulnerable. It's, it breaks down quite quickly. Um, and so if you're a sewer worker, You've got viruses like polio virus, um, pathogens like uh, Vibrio cholera, um, and things like norovirus that are much more readily spread in sewage. So if you're working as a plumber or are working with sewage, you've got to protect yourself against those. And the work methods and the work arrangements that have been put in place to protect workers against those should also protect workers against transmission from COVID-19 virus. And so if your current methods are protecting you from what's in sewage now, those same methods will protect you from the COVID-19 virus. And the same is true for wastewater outfalls, for example. If you've got wastewater disinfection to treat that wastewater to protect your aquaculture industry, shellfish areas, protect fishing, to protect people bathing or swimming in the water, again, the same protections that have been put in place in the past should protect against the COVID-19 virus. So it's not a game changer. We've had a big problem in the past with um, with cryptosporidium in the late 1980s, mm -hmm. early 1990s. Suddenly this pathogen emerged that was resistant to chlorine at normal levels. 
and it was a real game changer. We had to put in lots of UV disinfection systems all around the world. We had massive outbreaks. Um, but the COVID-19 virus isn't a game changer for the way we treat sewage and treat drinking water. And so for that reason, I think we can have a positive message about continuing with good practice. We've used it in a way as a reminder of the importance of that good practice. But having said that, I'm doing about uh, two conference calls a day at the moment to uh, worried sewer workers and so many other uh, microbiologists explaining these things because they are worried and uh, it's understandable they are worried. It sounds frightening when you hear reports of the virus being found in sewage and you are working with sewage and the virus is a deadly virus. Okay. Hey, everyone, I just want to jump back in, and I appreciate okay. that you keep the conversation going so well. I, in fact, I've been there for five minutes, but you were talking so nicely, right? I didn't want to stop you. Um, appreciate everyone for a small technical delay there, but uh, we're back. So let's get on to the audience questions as quickly as we can, and I appreciate everyone sending them in. If you have more questions, uh, please go ahead and type them into the question panel on the side. And we'll try to get some of them answered now, and then we'll try to get some of them answered and posted on our website, www.iwre.org, uh, after the event. Uh, first question I'm going to ask here comes from, and perhaps this was discussed by, in my small absence, um, uh, Del Karim uh, Ui, who asks that um, many African countries don't have modern sanitation systems, and that's true across many parts of uh, both the global north and the global south. Um, could you suggest what's the best solution to control the pandemic? I mean, of course, this goes on a little bit beyond uh, maybe perhaps your scope, but maybe uh, what, what are the best ways to, to take what are the lessons that we've learned here and discussed today uh, and apply that to perhaps less modern sanitation systems? Yeah, in, in terms of the, the general response, I think uh, well, we've all seen the, uh, the, the responses about uh, hygiene and social distancing and uh, and then was already referring to um, the, the, the importance of uh, safely managed water systems um, to uh, keep diseases low, uh, to um, to serve as uh, good quality water for uh, to support hygiene. Uh, toilet hygiene are are all uh, key elements of uh, uh, combating the, um, the 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 illness. And well, the, the, I think also. Things like sewage surveillance. We we have been talking to uh, people in, for instance, Uganda, uh, where they also see the opportunities that sewage surveillance could offer as a relatively efficient tool to monitor virus circulation in uh, larger cities uh, um, and, and but also smaller cities. Yeah, I think hand washing stations. I mean access. I mean, we've been talking about it for a long time, and I know Dan has been promoting, you know, access to water and, and you know, the, the whole wash issue, right? But people are doing something about, I mean, I think that that, that silver lining is that because pe the coronavirus is so global, we're seeing utilities trying to respond to areas that don't have uh, taps in their homes, for example, and try to bring in more water tankers that have stations where they can wash their hands and um, think about as they as they make uh, build access to toilets um, that they put hand washing stations along with those so there's a lot more discussion i think about this idea that the um what we do you know the one water concept right it's sanitation it's water resources it's access to to safe water right and, and this is a, a holistic view that we need to promote. And I, and I agree, in, in developing regions of the world, they're just not going to have enough. There's, there's limited resources to monitor, which is why selected monitoring and maybe mapping would help. Here's a question that comes, I'm going to kind of um, combine two questions here. Um, but, uh, and hopefully this doesn't get too political, so uh, you can feel free to uh, modify your answers, uh, depending. But uh, Shun uh, Ho Lee uh, asks, um, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has been criticized by um, uh, late responses. Uh, and do you think that, how, how yeah, you know, should there be reform at the WHO? Um, but I think another question is just to say, you know, how can the WHO be a better, better um, equipped to make this response in the future? And Carolina Arrea asks um, how we can have 
better vigilance and planning in the global south. I, I note that uh, myself and, um, uh, well, Dan, you're, uh, we're, we're generally in uh, the global north here. Um, and so the question is how, how can we extend some of our researching into deeper into the south? I think we can answer very quickly about that from the water and sanitation side, um, that there's a bigger planning that World Health Organization does for pandemic response and I'm not sure we can comment on that, but in the water sanitation side, um, the World Health Organization had, had a very quick response. They put out um, technical briefs, they put out guidance on hand washing, guidance on uh, providing safe water, wastewater, uh, access to water and sanitation. They've got a very detailed um, whole package of guidance. And one of the things they put in their, their system of water safety plan, sanitation safety plan, is barrier based systems. They've actually protected us from a whole range of pathogens. And you can see that the COVID-19 virus can't get through your drinking water barriers. It can't get through your wastewater barriers. If you've got a good sanitation safety plan now that meets the World Health Organization guidance or a good water safety plan now that meets that guidance, the processes in place to manage water safety and manage sanitation will also manage transmission of COVID-19 by those routes by those pathways. So those World Health Organization systems that have moved from being based on testing a pathogen to putting in place a generic barrier to all pathogens have been successful. So we're not seeing waterborne transmission of COVID-19. We're not seeing transmission of COVID-19 virus via um, sanitation systems. So those WHO systems are actually working. And the WHO COVID-19 has, uh, has a very good set of uh, a website, with a very good set of resources for um, water sanitation. So in terms of the water sanitation and health and hygiene part of WHO, their response has been faultless. But we, we can't comment on the bigger picture because we don't work in that space. And uh, But I can share with you a, um, a website after this that summarizes what I've just said as a, as a reference summary of that response. So do. Let's, uh, let's uh, share that website and we'll put it on our website. Uh, we'll put that website on our website. We'll put the link to that website on our material. Uh, www.iwrate.org. Um, that'd be great if we share that. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, let's try to squeeze in a few more questions here. Um, we have a question from um, um, no, there is one from you. Uh, This is perfect. Gary Holiday asks, um, you know, if we have a good uh, message to communicate to the public, but there's fear, then um, how do we sort of, you know, use the the research that we're doing here um, to really communicate to the public and and be able to show with the research and the evidence um, from wastewater um, and from the modern and the mapping, you know, how do we use that to really clearly communicate to the public? And perhaps to improve their um, understanding and knowledge of um, uh, what type of mapping and research this is, because many people don't understand what this really, really is all about. You know, I always, I always, it always struck me that a single sample doesn't ever help you, and so, and there's an urgency for information and data, and every day you're getting an update, you know, on the number of cases and this kind of thing. And I think with wastewater and and um, Gertman said it very well, you know the the um, it's about a trend and it's about comparisons like comparison to this city and that city and over time so we need those we need you know we need a whole picture and we need time to, to gather that and then communicate it in an appropriate way so it's not going to be a single sample you know update <laughs> kind of thing right it's going to be a characterization of what's happening in the, the in the community over time or in the comparison of communities I don't know. Um, Dan, what's the communication crowd say? <laughs> well, I can add a little bit to that. Um, I think what uh, many people, I mean, we've been uh, doing this type of research on, on waterborne viruses in our uh, or institute labs for a long time and communicating with uh, the specialists in, in the utilities 
about uh, water safety plans and, and sanitation safety plans and log removal values. And so I think um, the, 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 the in-crowd is very aware that uh, viruses are very well managed in all our water systems. But I think they're, they're, apart from this in-crowd, uh, many people, even in the water sector, are um, uh, now uh, facing this, uh, faced with this new virus, are questioning how well are we protected? How do we, how do we know that? So I think uh, one of the key elements is is just uh, re-emphasizing uh, and restating the, the information that we already have in the light of this new virus. Uh, uh, and uh, like Dan was saying, that if we have things safely managed for um, for the waterborne virus, we also know that we have things safely managed for this new virus. So. Um, Illustrating that uh, and showing the knowledge that we have uh, in a relatively condensed uh, way is, I think, already very helpful in uh, in well convincing people that we know about viruses, we control viruses, uh, and so we will also control this new one uh, through the water uh, pathway. Yeah, where the where there's been some confusion is people sometimes get confused. They say, "You tell us this virus, you can control it." you can kill it quite easily, but how come it's causes pandemic? And then we explain the big difference with this virus is that if you do get infected with it, it's got a much higher chance of killing you. Um, but the actual transmission pathway from in water and sanitation is well controlled. Um, and so you shouldn't catch it from those pathways. You'd be, you'd be very unlucky to catch it from those pathways. You'd be very unlikely to catch it from those pathways, but it's not hard to catch from the respiratory pathway. And if you do, it can kill you. So that's why the message seems conflicted with saying, don't worry about um, transmission through water and sanitation because we already manage virus. They're saying, but this virus is different. And it's, it's different in a way that matters for public health and communication, communicable disease through transmission from person to person. But it's not different in a way that matters for our, our water and sanitation. Um, it already is controlled by those pathways. We're lucky, I suppose, maybe in the, in the future, some new virus may emerge that is, highly resistant to chlorine and deadly. That would be a big problem for us, for example. Okay, well, I think on that note, um, it's a few minutes after the hour, so it's a good time for us to maybe close this off. Um, as I said uh, to everyone in the audience, you know, if we didn't get the opportunity to ask your question, I'll go ahead and pass these over to our uh, panelists. Uh, Hopefully they'll have a chance, if they have time, uh, to respond uh, in a written form. And we'll put those on our website, uh, www.iwra.org, actually, along with uh, the PowerPoints and along with the recording of this video, of this uh, webinar. So you can go back and watch as many times as you like. Um, I would again like to thank everybody on the panel. Uh, Dan Deere at the Water Futures Australia, uh, Professor Rosina Giron at the uh, Department of Genetics at the University of Barcelona, uh, Professor Ro Joan Rose, uh, Chair of Water Research at Michigan State University, and uh, Professor Virjan Medima, uh, uh, Chair of Water and Health at TU Delft. Um, some of the panel and IWA itself are all on Twitter, so if you feel so inclined, if you're into Twitter, go ahead and look them up, follow them, uh, retweet them, uh, engage with them there. Um, and if any of these presentations left you uh, interested in learning more, uh, go ahead and check out our LinkedIn web page, uh, and you can try to continue the discussion there. Um, and uh, follow us for more information. Um, I really hope that uh, everyone found the insights provided by our panel uh, during this special event uh, to be really helpful, um, and to be um, a source of both um, in information and perhaps of some reassurance. So I think it gave us uh, all a lot of material to think about and um, in terms of you know, your own work, since many of us here are water professionals, hopefully you're able to take this and either use it directly or to um, use some of the, the techniques and the ideas uh, to advance your own work as well. So I just want to remind everybody again that this webinar was brought to you by the International Water Resources Association, an almost 50-year-old nonprofit, non-governmental educational organization. We focus on bridging disciplines and geographies and connecting professional students, individuals, corporations, and institutes, all who are concerned with the sustainable use of the world's water resources. So if you're interested in learning more about the association or becoming a member, please go to www.iwa.org. So, on behalf of the whole IWA office and on behalf of my panel, uh, thank you so much for coming to our webinar. I uh, really appreciate your, your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.